So no matter where you start uh, to talk about <coughs> academic advising, the conversation of ethics has to come into play at some point. So my first day at Eastern Arizona College as an academic advisor started out something like this. And you might, you might be able to relate to that. First, first appointment, they came, come in. We're doing registration in the fall. And we're looking at classes, trying to build a schedule. First question that comes out of a student, a future student, it was actually someone brand new to Eastern Arizona College, with their parents in the room, sitting with them, is, OK, I need to take X class. So I pull up, and we start looking at the options for X class. We start to look at the options, and what do the parents say to me? Which teacher is the best teacher? Automatically, we're in the middle of an ethics discussion. What does a counselor do? What do you do? You've probably had that question before. How do you deal with that? It's not real easy because we all have our own ideas. We all have our own philosophy. We all have our own learning styles. And there are people that seem to fit those in different ways. So ethics is quite important to everything that we do. As an academic advisor, uh, we use Nakata as kind of our go-to. It's the national organization for academic advising for colleges and universities. Now, before I go any further, don't try to write all of this stuff down. If you're interested, you just let us know. I'll, I'll electronically send you my slides. I only have four because they only gave me 15 minutes, and I know Gina's going to take part of my time, so I'm going to go 12. All right, so three minutes a slide. All right, there, that's an ethical question too there, but <laughs> Nakata is what we use, um, and I have a pointer with the Gila monster on it, but I literally have to go right there for you to see it, so it's not going to do me too good. But basically, this is the statement I'd like to, to share with you. Ethics, the, the one above also, ethics is always an issue for advisors as they have a dichotomous role at the university or college. They are advocates for students. That's our first role. We're advocates for students. We keep that foremost in our mind. What is the best interest of the student? But at the same time, we are also an institutional representative. So we represent Eastern Arizona College. In other words, advisors, advisors have no ethically neutral place from which to advise. We, we're there. I mean, we, we're on both sides, all right? Advisors' code of ethics based on many standards and values. Although advisors' own values and ethical beliefs ground their ethical decisions, there's two professional documents that provide guidance to, uh, to advisors, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So that's Nakata. <clears throat> the other thing that we have to keep foremost in our mind anytime we're doing academic advising is FERPA. Uh, let's go back to my first day at Eastern Arizona College. All right? Uh, student was in there, comes in with parents. Not unusual to have a parent come in with a student. It is not unusual to have a parent also call on the phone on behalf of their son or daughter. So what do you do? Do you just talk to them? Well, they're their parents. Yeah? Yeah. But if it's a general type question and they're not giving it anything privately, shouldn't that if yeah, if they want to know where the building is, if they want to know, you know, things like that. But if it come, if it's anything about the student's education, picking classes, teachers, what kind of uh, what kind of placement testing, different things like that, there has to be a FERPA form signed prior to talking to anyone other than the student. 
FERPA forums are at the records office. Uh, our records does great at that. In fact, they'll ask when people come to uh, be admitted at the window there, they'll ask them if they, want, if they won't fill out a FERPA form, which is wonderful. And then on Beacon, we can see it. We can see if they have a FERPA form on file. But they also have it in the athletic department. Don't yeah. They? I mean, they have well, they all have. Jim, why don't you answer that? Do we have it in the athletic department? Huh? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I have it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Students do not have to sign the release for their parents. You know, it makes our job a little more dicey when that happens, but we just have to tell the parent respectfully, you know, your son or daughter uh, has rights based on FERPA, the Family Education Act, uh, but it's built actually for the privacy of the student and their educational uh, pursuits. That's really what FERPA is all about. Uh, so sometimes parents aren't really happy about that. Well, I'm their son or daughter. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples where this comes into to, uh, consideration. Well, I can't, you can't talk to my son or daughter right now because they're in school. They're in high school. And they, you know, they're not available when you're available to talk to them. Well, I know, but we have to have the FERPA uh, sign. Um, my son or daughter's on a mission, and I'm trying to do their scheduling for them prior to them coming home. Wonderful. We want to help you do that. We'll help you any way we can, but you, you still have to get this signed. And we can do that by email. That's done by email through records as well. They can sign something from wherever they are on their mission, and then we can talk to them easily. That's not a problem. So that's another thing that we have to uh, keep into consideration. <clears throat> and then our own just code of ethics. And this is probably what I'll spend the most time on and then turn some time over. Ethics is uh, th that first statement I already read to, to you. This is confidentiality. That's one of the biggest things that when a student comes in, I, I would say by far the majority of the time that we work with students is working with graduation, working with transferring, working with building schedules, you know, that kind of thing. That's, that is a lot of what we do. However, you cannot discount the times that we visit a lot with students on personal issues. And personal issues when they walk in, things like, suffering from depression, anxiety, um, having issues, uh, just, just all kinds of issues. Separation issues, believe it or not, is a big thing at times. And so they come in, a student comes in, and sometimes they are not quite willing to just share exactly what is going on until you tell them, at least what we tell them is, everything you say in here is confidential. If anything's said about what we talk about in here today, you're going to say it because I can't, and I won't, unless you give me permission. So everything in here is confidential. There are three things that we have to report. If you have killed someone, we have to report that. If we feel like you are a very real danger to yourself or to someone else, we have to report that, okay? If you have been physically abused or have physically abused someone, uh, especially a minor, we have to report that. Those are things we have to report. Other than that, it's confidential. Well, I signed a FERPA form. You can tell my parents, well, not unless you tell me I can, all right? So confidentiality is super important about what we go in. And I, and I hope you all realize that in the counseling office, that's a big deal to us. Being confidential is a big deal, all right? So rest assured, we, we, we take that very seriously. 
We also strive to make sure every student is served equitably and fair. Kenny Smith's views on everything, believe it or not, it's hard for me to believe at times, aren't the same as everyone else's. All right? I have to be careful. Okay? You, you just have to realize that students come from all different walks of life. They look at things differently. Their cultural background, their socioeconomic background, their idea of life, their religion. You know, it's, they're trying to grow up. All right? Um, I, I taught school for a long time, or as a counselor a long time. Uh, junior high, I called them the hormonally challenged group. All right? That's what I called all of our junior high students. At this level, at kindergarten level, everybody knew what they wanted to do when they, gra when they became an adult. All kindergartners know exactly what they want to do. When they come to Eastern Arizona College, I'm becoming more and more convinced they have no idea what they want to do because now they've got so many more options. And we have to be able to allow them a fair and equitable basis to make that decision. And we try to do that as best we can based on their transcripts, based on what they're telling us, career surveys, different things like that. All right? Uh, we also try to be very fair about avoiding any personal conflict of interest uh, so we can deal objectively and impartially. There, there are times where Gina will bring a student over to me and say, hey, you know, I think maybe you would work better here or I do the same to any of my colleagues. Um, we, we visit about it and, uh, and we feel like we're doing the best service that way. You know, we can't. We're not, one person does, can't do every single thing, you know. Uh, the other thing that we do a lot, quite honestly, is if they come in and they need some help, if they're needing something very specific to a certain subject area, we'll refer, refer them to you as advisors. We'll say, hey, listen, the, the professional business administration person is Michael Fox. That's the director of the business over there right now he's you need to talk to him this is what I know about business administration if you wanted to go to ASU U of A BYU wherever they're wanting to go but specifically you always ought to talk to your advisor in that subject area because they go to ATF meetings they go to things where they have more information than we have and so we try to to share that a little bit but we really do try to be impartial about issues that uh, that may come up. All right. And last uh, part of that is <clears throat> it's important that we treat them fair and equitably, that there's no harassment involved in any kind, uh, that they feel comfortable when they're there. We don't make any judgments about anything that they're telling us. We're just trying to help them make the best decision they can. Uh, we referred, I already referred to that one. And then uh, we're trying to give the most accurate information that we possibly can. You know, and that's why a lot of times you'll hear from our office things like, well, that's not what it says in the catalog. <laughs> when we're referring students to what they need to take, we look at those course designs. We look at course sequencing guides we, follow. we just follow whatever the book says and then we have a student come back and say well that's not what so-and-so said mm -hmm. and I say I can only advise on what I have and this is what it says in the book and that's what we're refer referring to a lot of times here we try to give the most accurate information we're open to more accurate information <laughs> if you have more accurate information for us please share it with us and we'd be glad to help in that, in that uh, way, all right? Ethics, questions, answers? <laughs> all right, thank you very much. <clears throat>
imparting accurate information um, while complying with institutional policies and rules. I'm fortunate enough to serve on two committees. One is the academic standards, and I've been on it for three, I don't know how many years I've been on it. Six years. Oh, <laughs> six years, time flies. And it, for the first year, I didn't vote because it went so quick, I didn't understand the policies. I'm getting better. But that last slide that he talked about of providing accurate information to students, I know how I feel when I accidentally or never intentionally give wrong information. It just makes your stomach turn. When a student comes to you and says, but you said all I needed was this. And so they go up to the academic standards and they um, petition saying that Gina Roebuck said this and she's wrong, so you should fire her because now I can't graduate. Or Kenny Smith misadvised. Trust me, it makes us more sick than you'll ever know because we never ever want to intentionally um, misadvise. That's never our, our, our purpose or intent. But today, um, on my part, right? Because right. okay. it doesn't happen, <laughs> ever. But, and then the other committee that I serve on <clears throat> is a CERC, which is a Continuous Improvement Review Committee. Is that right? Okay, the CERC. And I'm going towards Shannon because she's on the committee as well. And I guess we, we, um, we take the surveys of the stakeholders in the community, and then we review the surveys, and then we talk about them. And so student life, community, I mean, I don't know what else, graduate survey, and they always ding us. <laughs> they ding us hard in counseling. And it's hard not to get my feathers ruffled and my hair kind of starts sticking up. Because I know what we do in our office. Because I know that we do a really, really good job in, in counseling. And we do it intentionally. And we love what we do. And so I usually come down from our meetings feeling a little deflated, a little beat up that I feel I have to defend my colleagues. And it's not like to make us feel bad in any way, but it's just to bring to our attention of things that we need to be aware of. So I'd kind of go down into Sharon's office and I'm like, you know, ready to say, well, that's it. You know, we only saw 6,000 students and three complained. And so Sharon's very good about putting things into perspective. The backdrop of 6,000 or so students, I think she's going to talk to you about statistics. So when you kind of put it back like that, it makes me feel a little bit better. If we're seeing about 6,000 students and maybe two or three might have something to say about Gina Roebuck, like she sucks, like she's terrible. I'm okay with that. I'd rather have them come after me, but I'd rather really in those surveys if they could just say Gina, not counseling, then we can work on Gina, not counseling. But so today, so um, I've learned not to become so defensive. I'm, I'm getting better with learning um, more things um, being on these two um, committees. And so I kind of wanted to talk today about characteristics of a good advisor, a good counselor. But before I begin that, well, let me just say, I did research, not very, <laughs> I Googled. I didn't even research. I Googled, <laughs> like, yesterday I was six, I Googled the day before. And it talked about the United States uh, survey of university counselors and they do a survey and they talked about 14 characteristics of ethical counselors or conscientious counselors, five characteristics of this type of counselor, six characteristics. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do all of us a favor because I can talk. Kenny's right, I can talk. I'm only going to talk about two that I think that are important for us. But before I do that, I was talking to Sharon this morning, <clears throat> and so this is a backdrop in the background of a good or uh, counselor with good characteristics. This is what we deal with every day, from 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Not every day, but this kind of gives you a bird's eye view of what our day is like. And I thought, you know, I'd like to share this with you. And this, and I'm going to ask my colleagues in counseling to add on. But, of course, we register students, you know, because October 16th for this was the beginning of uh, open registration for the spring, and classes are already closed, believe it or not. We deal with financial aid and scholarships. That's a given. Everybody knows that. We should know that. And when we don't know the answers, of course, we're always 
making those connections with financial aid, making connections with gift, athletics, records, upstairs in the dean's wing. So that's a given. We try to um, stroke those relationships because it's for our students. However, behind the backdrop of that, we have, all of us, at one point or another, not daily, but at least weekly, we might have a student that comes in and says, hey, I need to quit school. I need to withdraw out of classes because my sister or my brother just tried to commit suicide. I have to drop out of school and I gotta go back to Mesa. Or I can't take the classes because I'm worried about my parents. I'm worried about my siblings that are left at, at home. Um, so we're dealing with that. And uh, you might have, a, you know, we have our athletes, they come from all over the world. They come from Bulgaria, they come from all over, um, Europe, we have kids from Georgia, Hawaii, Florida, New Mexico, Colorado. They're coming in. They're having a difficult time adjusting. They're living in the dorms. Um, they might be loud. They might be fighting. Um, we have an athlete. We might have athletes that are probably the best of where they are, and now they're coming, and they were the best, and now they're amongst the best of the best in whatever sport, and so now they're not excelling in their sport, and therefore it's deflated their... Um, confidence and therefore they're kind of lacking in school. Um, some students might have difficulty with teachers. Uh, they don't know how to approach the teachers. They don't know what to say. Granted, most of them probably aren't doing their part, but you still listen. I don't know why they don't like me. Hmm, maybe because you missed eight times. But I try <laughs> not to say that. I mean, I'm supportive, right? Um, and on top of in, in in the tone that we are, where we are today, um, attempted suicide, we are being impacted. Of course, I said at the very beginning about brothers and sisters, but I've even had students who have attempted suicide. We see these students in our offices, okay? We also see students who have personal problems fitting in, roommate if issues, difficulties, not getting along with people that they live with. There is an adjustment issue, not only in the dorms, but even in the apartments, relationship problems, domestic violence, boyfriend and girlfriend. One semester I had a girl who came with a black eye. How can she focus on school, you know? Um, family problems, um, financial aid problems, being away from home for the first time. What we do see in counseling is like a <clears throat> an ebb and flow. So we're talking about summertime, we're hitting it hard and it's really, really busy. Uh, June, July, August, and it's a rush, and we don't know what day it is. It just kind of blends in. And then there's like a lull. Like, oh, I can answer my 4,000 calls. Oh, let me get back to the 6,000 emails. Yeah, I have time. Hey, do you want to go to lunch? Because I have time today. So it kind of turns out like that. And I'm not saying, no way am I saying that we work any harder than any one of you, because I know you all work hard in your respective areas. But there's like an ebb and flow and... Uh, and like uh, around September, it kind of slows down. So then that's when we're gonna start seeing more of these personal problems coming in. Because now the novelty is worn off. You know what? I thought my roommate was so cute. She's so fun and blah, blah, blah. And about five weeks later, I hate her. I can't stand her. She's messy. I don't like her. Or I like my teacher because she was so cool or he was so cool. And now he's expecting us to do work. I hate school. You know, so all these things, it's an ebb and flow. They come and they go. So. Behind all of that, so this is kind of like the backdrop of what we're dealing with on a daily basis. The two things that I think anyway, oh wait, hold on, excuse me. Is there anything else that you want to add on? Okay. So the two things that, uh, that I feel that are characteristic of a good counselor, number one, um, being very positive, being very open, being very encouraging. So this is kind of what it's like for me in my office because I'm flanked between Mr. All-American Kenny and Miss Happy Gayreen. <laughs> and this is, how it, this is how it sounds. I don't, I don't mean to mimic or you know, make fun of them. This is how it sounds. So if I'm in my office trying to listen to Hawaiian music, trying to mind my own business, hopefully if I just crumble up into a ball, nobody sees me, nobody knows that I'm there, I don't have to work. Never happens. But Mr. Smith is like this, hey, how are you? Come on in, how can I help you? I'm like, oh, I'm gonna shoot him now, because he's so happy. 
but that's what he does. Come on in, slams drawers. Come on in, sit down. How can I help you? And that's to the left. And our walls seriously separates us. Our computers are literally be right, right next to each other. So I almost hear everything. The bad thing is he hears everything I say too. That's not always good. So that's Kenny. And then on the right side of me, I have Gary. Hi, my name is Gary. How can I help you today? This is what I hear. This is what we do. This is how we welcome our students. Guess what? They keep on coming back, 6,000 of them. I think that's what the last count is. So that's what you kind of hear um, when students come in. And I will not lie. I will not lie. On that survey, on one of the ones that I, was <clears throat> that I served on, they did admit that she was grouchy and kind of like rude. It might have been me. <laughs> Because Sharon and I both knew it wasn't Gay Reen because she's so happy. <laughs> and I think it was me because, first of all, I was hungry and I was tired. <laughs> so I really think that survey was me. But we really, really work hard to be positive, to be welcoming, to be open, encouraging, fun. We like to have fun in our office, if you don't know that by now. And so that part, they can come in, and we want to be, we want to be available to the students whenever they need us. Um, sometimes we're not, uh, but we really try to be very accommodating to the students. So I think that's the number one characteristic of a good advisor, is to just be very open and positive and encouraging. And that's just our personality. That's the personality of the counseling office. The second one is, um, what's the second one? Ah, knowledgeable. Um, when I advise, I always think about this. The faculty, some of you, many of you, can be PhDs, can be doctors, can be the best in your field, and you probably are, and that's why you're working at Eastern Arizona College. However, if you have on the knowledge here and you don't know how to impart that, so say example, Ray Orr, say he's a PhD in math, and he's so smart up here, and he has it all up here, and he knows what he's saying, but he doesn't have the ability or the know-how to be able to impart that information on to the students. For me, I'm thinking, that's kind of hard. That's hard. You can have all the knowledge up here, but you're not, you don't have the ability to relay it to the students. So that's kind of how I feel about uh, being knowledgeable about the classes that you should be put in or the curriculum that you're interested in. It's constantly changing. And it goes back to the last slide or the last bullet of Kenny's. It's never, ever, ever our intention to ever put you in a wrong, put students in a wrong class. It makes us sick. However, we are only as brilliant and smart as a person who puts it into the catalog or whatever the curriculum is, because we do follow that. And so with that constantly changing, we really put it back on the students, and I know I do, to say, OK, so it looks like you're good to graduate. I need for you to do me a favor. I need for you to triple check me. If there are any discrepancies, then you come back and we can work on it together. I have learned that over the years. Rather than take responsible for the students, I put it back on them. Because it is always changing. It's constantly changing. By the time they send the print out to, to get it printed, it's already outdated, correct? correct. So, so you want to just make sure that when you're dealing with students, you just ask them to do it. And so because it's... It is good to be knowledgeable, but it's hard to be knowledgeable about everything because it's constantly changing. Um, I, always, I usually try to put it back on the students. Uh, so those are the only two things I think. Now, I don't know if you guys want to add on to that about what a good counselor, characteristics of a good counselor. Ah, non-judgmental. That's a good one. You want to add on to that and talk about that? Well, I just think that um, out of all the places on our campus, anyone should be able to walk into our reception area and feel safe. Yeah. And, um, and, and Kenny alluded to this, you know, that, that even when you may not agree with something, you, you have to work really hard to put that aside. And, and I am, I, I've gotten on people in the front, you know, and, you know, you really don't voice your opinions out here in the reception area. I don't want somebody sitting there and somebody going off about something and, mm -hmm. and uh, this person, it may affect them. So I, you know, 
I don't know if, uh, in fact, I don't think a person can be totally non-judgmental, but um, keep it in keep check. Your opinions to yourself, you know, and and just try to be open-minded um, because we hear things that. I sometimes think that, um, in particular, maybe our administration doesn't real, they don't realize the things that we do hear. Um, you know, sometimes students wait until they get away from home to come in and talk to you about things. And, you know, there's been a few times that, you know, I could just feel the hair on top of my head rising. So, um, but you, that, I think, is really important. Okay, so... So to, re to recap, just being positive, open, encouraging, you know, just being really ourselves, really is what it's boiling down to. So ourselves being very open. Number two, knowledgeable about the curriculum. And then number three, basically being non-judgmental and open. Are there any questions? Fantastic. I did it in 15. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> All right, I'm Garen Claridge. I'm the Occupational Advisor in Counseling, although all, all of us do occupational advising, but my funding is tied to what I do. I, I'm actually under Carl Perkins and have been for 29 years, and so they mainly send me occupational students, and what I call an appointment with a student who basically needs everything is an A to Z appointment. So today I decided to talk to you about A to Z occupational advising and kind of what goes on in my office. Bottom line is I'm on advisory committees. I'm on every advisory committee that EAC has for all of the occupational programs. Okay. Now I'm on advisory on, committees. We look to community members, people in the industry to guide our occupational programs about what we are offering, what we're teaching students, keeping up with industry trends, those are very important, and I go to all of those. And on the year that we meet separately, I get fat every October because I get to go to every meal also. I do a thing, I, I want to try to tell you some things that you may or may not know about. I do articulated credits, and basically we have articulated agreements th with Fort Thomas, Pima, Thatcher, Safford, Duncan, Evett, down in the valley and bottom line is some students will have taken courses in high school and they can get free credits here at EAC. Sometimes they only need just a couple of electives to get across the finish line. That's a very important thing to know for your students. Do you by any chance have any classes you took in high school you could get credit for? I always ask them as soon as they sit down, do you have any transcripts out there that were waiting to come in? Because if, if they've got a couple of transcripts coming in or already here, they think they've been evaluated and they haven't, then I need to know that. We now have access where we can pull up a, a scan transcripts from records and kind of see what they've taken. So that's a very helpful thing. What I try to do, I try to be the very best I can at all times. That is sometimes not easy, but you want that student to feel like they are the only person in your world, that you don't have about 10 other pressures that you're thinking about. You want them to, they, especially if they've traveled onto campus, some of these people, they will make appointments and travel five hours to meet with a counselor. You don't want them in out the door in 10 minutes. You wanna make sure that Everything that they may have wanted to ask is answered. I think that's a very important thing. I, I'm an older returning student. I went to school when I was almost 40 years old. I can totally relate to our adult learners who come on campus. I think I mainly work with people from the Valley. A lot of Gila Valley people, they will come over to EAC to get occupational degrees and certificates. So a lot of them will end up in my office and I think that's great. My catalog, I learned this from someone and I love it. Actually, I think it was Gwen Lewis. I mark up my catalog. And any changes that are coming down the pike, I need to know about that because it's going to make a difference on how I'm going to advise that student for future semesters. You're no longer going to have to take HC 289, so I mark that in my book. I put the date that it happened. That's one of the very best practices that I do. I really like that a lot. Certificates of proficiency. Certificates from EAC, we have 21 degrees, 44 certificates, and bottom line, there are multiple exit points in occupational programs. We want to constantly monitor to make sure if a student's earned that certificate, 
that it's on their way to them. I think that's important. Angie Dixon does over a thousand certificates a year. Carolee Bailey is very instrumental. She does all the allied health. She does a ton of work on the allied health certs. Those are sent out by registered mail. That way the student can't say they did not receive them. Those are applied for by Gila Hank Online now. That's, it also can be done by instructors. If someone's finished a cert, send it in. Matter of fact, Angie actually prefers it by instructors almost over Gila Hank. But, but it's a nice, efficient way. We want to get those certs to them. As a matter of fact, that's a very important thing in financial aid. So I use a thing called Closest to Completion. It's in CARS, and it will pull up, where is that student exactly? Do they have a certificate coming? I find people have certificates coming all the time that they never even knew they had. And so I think that's, I love the close to completion, and I love computer services. They have done a phenomenal job here at the college. Our certificates are a way to get the skills and knowledge to get the certifications, which are industry recognized certifications. I think that's a very important distinction and I discuss that with my students. We give you the knowledge, but that certification from an industry, like a nationally recognized certification, is that's what's going to get them jobs. So I think that's a very important thing also. Um, love the course sequencing sheets, we've talked about that. Could not live and do occupational without those course sequencing sheets. And if something changes, I need to know about it. Careers, I love advising careers. Share, a lot of times counseling will send me the undecideds because I, I think career advising is important. Sharon believes in serendipity that, it, serendipity that it's serendipitous and I totally agree with that too. Just because you went to school for one thing, which probably almost applies to everyone, doesn't mean you're going to end up being that in life. And so you may start out one career. The wonderful thing about living in the United States is we can change our careers, not just jobs, multiple times. The range now is about seven to nine times in a lifetime. So I, I really like talking to, to students about careers. Uh, we have Career Coach on our webpage, which I think is a really neat thing. It's about halfway down one of the little turning boxes. And it's Career Coach. You can do career interest inventories. You can browse programs. I use another tool almost daily in my office. It's called the Occupational Outlook Handbook. You just type that into your search bar and it is a wealth of information. You can tell the student what they can expect to make, what type of training is needed, what type of working conditions they will be under. I think that's an important thing too. If you have someone who wants to be a nurse, which is a lot of times shift work, not always, then you need to talk to them about that. EMT paramedicine, if you have small children at home, can you can you leave on a moment's notice? I, I take so many things into career advising, but I do like that. It's one of my favorite things, actually. I, directing conversations, when we're talking about helicopter parents, if I have a parent sitting in my office and they're wanting to ask every single question in that appointment, I'll look at them when they're asking it and then I will answer the student. I will tell the answer to the student. I won't even tell the answer to the parent. That's how I try to redirect and get that student to start beginning to engage in the conversation about their future. So I think that's a really important technique. Another thing I learned from Gwen Lewis, who was one of our counselors, if you get a really long-winded student in your office, you haven't even got around to lunch yet, you've got a one o'clock class, what, you, you just stand up and you just start moving to the door while the conversation is still going on. Pretty soon you're out the door and you're done with the appointment. That has helped me more times than once. So I like that. I'm actually not going to do A to Z, but I've, hit, I've got quite a few things in here. When I'm talking to a student, I talk about their entire life. If they're not a morning student, I'm not going to recommend an 8 o'clock in the morning class. Are they commuting onto campus? Do they have small children at home? Work schedules? I, I just talk about everything. Minor A to Z appointments, we allow an hour per student. A lot of people don't realize that. We're not a 15 minute appointment. We're an hour per student office and if they take that entire hour, so be it. Um, I've got an example for that. The TANF them from the reservations, I work with many students from San Carlos and Bailas. They changed the TANF band schedule and they now go home at 1.15. All of the students that I'm working with, they, they can't take afternoon classes, they can't take evening classes. It's their only mode of 
they just changed it back for three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and that was for three students who petitioned. And so I almost put that in. I'm hoping to work with them. We need more. We, if that's their only mode of transportation, we need more. I don't think they'll ever do a go home at 10 o'clock at night class, so that knocks out a lot of welding and AMT and stuff like that. But, oh, speaking of AMT, I think it's really important not to use shortcut words or acronyms. You may know it, that may be what you've always called it, but they're looking at you like, and, and they won't ask. They won't ask, what do you mean by that? So I try to not use shortcut words or acronyms when I'm working with students. I think that's a really important thing too. I try to treat them like I was treated when I was coming back and scared to death sitting in a counselor's office for my one class I was going to take that one semester. i tell you about another thing. We do fast track certificates. I call them fast track because they're quicker than a degree. And I have a, a really neat sheet. Jerry Luke has actually reformatted it for me. It looks much nicer. But it'll tell them what can I earn in one semester, what can I earn in two, what can I earn in three. If you're going to go three, you may as well at least get a general technical studies degree, use a certificate as your base certificate. But bottom line is if we have someone in there, they need, it, they need something and they need it now, we can get them through something in one semester and they can go out and get a job. So I provide that for a lot of undecided students. I like that. It's not in any other format that I know of. I come up with things in my office that I like. And so that, that's one thing I use a lot. Talk a lot about financial aid. I love what Sharon says. How do you intend to pay for your education? It's an open-ended question. Let them tell you if they're on financial aid or scholarship or grandma's paying for it or whatever. But you have to address that because if they don't have the money and they don't meet that deadline on paying, they're going to get dropped and then most likely won't get back in many, many classes, especially occupational classes. Um, GI Bill, I send them to Marta Nelson and Records and that happens more than you would know. I use a website called Indeed.com. My job title is Job Placement and Occupational Advising, and with job placement being a very big component of my job, so Indeed.com pulls in job opening notices from all over the place for the student. Not all, but a lot, and they can use that any place. It's good, reliable information, and I use Indeed a lot. I always tell them about the Learning Center. I tell them about the quiet rooms in the library. Those were a, a, a great help to me. Maximum credit appeals, we do a lot of those. So we talk about financial aid and non-attendance, non-participation, and now how they're automatically dropped. I talk to them about that. I always, always tell them that they have to attend that first day of class or they will be withdrawn. And I think that's really important because that isn't how it used to be. So I always tell them about the ramifications. We, we discuss nutrition, we discuss exercise, we tell them about the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at, at the Learning Center. And because a lot of these kids, they come onto campus from Duncan and they forgot to bring anything with them. They don't have money to run over to Kainoa's or something and eat. And so I tell them what resources are available here on campus. I do a survey of occupational graduates. Many of you may not know this, but we actually track all of our occupational graduates. We had 138 last year, and I have results for all but 20, which is pretty good. The, the normal rate of return is 25, 26%, and we're up to about 85%. That's because Barbara Goykovich and I call. But bottom line is we track our occupational graduates. They're all offered job placement assistance. I'm a really good resume writer, honestly. I, I can crank out a really good resume in a short amount of time. I do that for community members also. A lot of people don't realize that. Just because they're not an EAC student doesn't mean they're not a potential EAC student. And so recruiting and retention, that's every one of our jobs. If a student can relate to just one person on campus, chances are they're going to come back for another semester and hopefully be a completer. I do skills day, and I see that as a recruitment activity. It takes about four months for a four-hour activity, but, but that's okay. We bring about 400 kids on campuses. We, we talk about scholarships, and that's basically a lot of what happens in my office. I love what I do. People keep asking me, are you retiring? I am not. I love what I do. I went to school a long time to get to where I'm at, and, and I still feel like I'm very effective. And so, nope, not retiring anytime soon. And so if your students, 
I always tell students, go talk to your advisor, come talk to us, go talk to everybody, you know, because someone may see something that I didn't see, and I think that's very important also. So that's what I do in my office. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, this is the only handout that I brought. This is an academic advising syllabus, and it's something that we try to give out to um, students, particularly new students who come in to make an appointment, because it talks about our mission statement, preparing for your appointment, and then advisor and student responsibilities. So I thought, um, and we have a lot of them, so I thought maybe you might like to take a look at those. <clears throat> so I'm just going to kind of tie things up and talk about be uh, best practices. Uh, we, this actually comes from all of us. We had a meeting um, sometime this summer to talk about what we were going to talk about today. And um, these are the things that I, I would say that, for the most part, all of us work on the same page. You know, there may be some tiny differences in how we work with students, but for the most part, we all are going to, we greet students in much the same way. You know, how can I help you? Um, I know that uh, when I'm done with a session on academic advising, what I always ask the student is, does this make sense? I try not to say, do you understand? Because that kind of, that, that sounds, I don't know, that almost sounds like you're putting them down. But I'll say, does that make sense to you? Because they won't tell you if it doesn't make sense. You know, and I've had times when I've looked at a student's uh, face and I knew that none of what I was telling them was making sense. So then I would ask. Does this make sense? Do you, it, are you understanding it? No. OK. Let me try to put it a different way. Uh, I think it's really important that, um, like Gina was talking about kind of the, this is, this is the, what we hear in the background, you know. And this is from a student will come in for academic advising. And sometimes you just ask the right question. You start to talk about classes, and then maybe something comes up. And this comes from being a good listener also, and being able to pay attention to body language. And I think we're all really good at that, and I think that that's a best practice as far as a counselor. You know, something's up. And so you just have to kind of keep prodding, and then pretty soon you hit the right question, and it's just like, blop, there it is. Um, a, a lot of that happens. Um, you want to make sure, um, besides making sure that they understand, I always give them my business card and tell them, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. That's my preferred way of um, communication. You know, somebody else may say, go ahead and call, uh, <clears throat> but I prefer email. But I want them to know that if they leave and they sit down at the computer and they're trying to put their schedule together, and they're like, what did she say? Um, that then they can email me and ask that question. I also think it's important to kind of summarize what you, you know, we, we talk to about, um, especially in academic advising. I may say to the student, OK, I'll see you in March, you know, to let them know the next time that registration opens, is in March, and that's going to be for summer and fall. Because I, you would be, well, maybe you wouldn't be surprised. Students don't read anything. And so I think that we have to give them lots of information. Um, and that's where I show them. I will go on to our website, and I tell them, this is one of your, your best tools that you have, is our website. You know, because they'll always say, well, what's this date, and what's this date? Oh, well, let me show you the academic calendar. You know, this is where you can get all of those questions answered. 
um, students, particularly in the summer, who have filed for financial aid and they don't realize that they can go to my FA on our website, that they actually need to do that and get signed in so then they can check on their, their award and see if they need other documents. Um, I think uh, another part of a best, uh, for us, our best practice, because we've had changes in our, um, um, our math, is to guide students into the best math pathway, as I call it. Uh, you know, is it going to be math 100 and math 140? Or do you anticipate maybe needing higher math and this is the way you need to go? You know, and we have those charts and I use mine all the time. Um, another thing is uh, getting ahead of the appointment. I always pull, because uh, we use Appointment Plus, which is a scheduling software, and in that then we have their student ID number and their phone number, and I can go in and pull them up and I can check and see, have they done their placement testing? Or is there a note from Barbara that says they're bringing a transcript? Um, I can see where they're from, you know, I can, and now at least there's a picture because I can't remember kids anymore, you know. Um, when you see that many students, it's hard. And so um, that's something that is a best practice, is getting ahead of the schedule, making sure that, you know, you know the type of students that you're going to be working with. And I have the marked up catalog because I don't do that, but I think it's really a good idea, the marking the catalog up. Because I use any changes made are in the online catalog, and that's the one that I use. Um, but I still think that that's a great idea. Uh, major clarification. This morning, I worked with a young man. General studies, that's what he is right now, and he is interested in administration of justice. And, and I'm like, well, what is it you think you want to do with administration of justice? And he, he really wasn't sure. So I went over everything with him, but then I gave him all of Chris Matthews' information. And I said, you need to go talk to him because he has worked in the field. He can, you know, he can guide you which, which way you should go. Uh, we have students who, you know, they're not even in the major that they want or that they're just in it because, well, that's what my dad did or that's what my mom did. And so that's where you start those career conversations. Gayreen loves career um, counseling. I don't because I do feel like so much of what happens to us, it's like in the right place at the right time. But those can be some really interesting conversations, taking it that, you know, going that way. And so I think that that's maybe one of the things that we all do a little bit differently is, is career counseling. Um, making sure info is correct, showing students how to use, giving them tools. They need tools. Um, ArizonaTransfer.com so that, you know, because they'll ask you, well, does this, tra does this transfer? Um, well, let me, let me show you. You know, it's, or showing them how to use uh, the U of A's website or showing them how to use ASU's website. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty um, user friendly. You know, so those are a lot of the, the things that I think that we do well. Um, one of the things that's been kind of tough is how do you evaluate? How do you, ev you know, it's not, it's different than teaching, although a lot of what we do is teach. We're teaching in our um, appointments. And so we did a survey. We did survey Monkey and we never got any answers. And then I didn't like the, the, the things that we were getting from the graduate exit survey. So we did a survey. Uh, as soon as a student walked out from seeing us, Barbara would give them uh, a survey. And they had to put their names on it and who they saw. So it, nothing was anonymous. And, you know, for the most, I think we had one or two that, it, they, I wouldn't even say they were negative. It was like, um, well, I, I would she like. She or he. They really talked too much. Or, yeah. Because <laughs> if, if it's not a he, Kenny's always out. He never gets dinged. 
<laughs> yeah. So, but we were finding out more of what we wanted to know about working with our students. And, you know, when it comes to the surveys, like I say, you know, we see about 6,000 students a year because we keep track of it on Appointments Plus. And, you know, if you've got a couple of students who are disgruntled, you know, that's, that's the way it is in anything. Um, there's always going to be somebody who's not happy. And a lot of them, uh, I think there were what, four? Three. Three. But some of it, like one of them was, <laughs> I just had to laugh. It was like, well, my counselor didn't tell me that this class was only offered in the spring. You've got the catalog. You know, <laughs> students need to take responsibility somewhere. And so some of the things that we, the feedback we get is that type of stuff. Um, and I'm not saying that we don't ever make mistakes, but we make very few. And I will say that. So, um, but some of the things that, uh, this is from UNC Charlotte, when it comes to evaluation, that they feel that it should be focused on several dimensions. The nature of the advising uh, relationship, <clears throat> frequency of different types of activities that take place during advising sessions, student satisfaction with academic advising, student's outcomes. Now this one, I'm just not sure what kind of outcomes we would use. This says uh, increases in knowledge of academic environment, understanding of career goals, um, and the advisor's satisfaction. So that might be, uh, that, that was pretty close to the survey that we did. And, um, but that's still, I'd still like to see us be able to evaluate what we do um, a little better. Are there any questions? We've about talked our ears off here, or your ears. Shannon? I'm just curious what the process is for our online students, our strictly online students. Do they, or our students that are outside of normal hours, do they, what is the process for those students? Um, we do quite a lot of email advising. Mm -hmm. And so it's, and we don't get uh, it's not like we get a list of online, you know, just strictly online students. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I do quite a lot, especially during the summer. I do a, quite a lot of online advising. Okay, so the online advising is through email. Or it's just through email. We looked at um, doing a chat, and nothing seemed feasible. And you know, one of the things is that there's only four of us. And so that makes it tough to pull somebody away to like monitor something like that. And, um, but I think for online, you know, online is going to be, the advising is going to be the same in your office. Uh, I mean, you're gonna give them the same information. And, you know, we all have scanners in our office and so we will scan um, information and email it to students and, oh, and that was another thing I was going to mention is we have these blue sheets that we use. We do a lot of general studies and that's something we want to make sure that students leave our offices with something in their hand and they always do you know because when it comes to advising we're gonna we're gonna do in order to advise correctly you have to do a grad check you have to see where they're at in their program and then you can write down your recommendations and we use registration forms for that so and then I show them how to register I try not to register students because I think it's something they should be doing themselves but I show them how to do it um, so that's an, that's another thing Okay, 